I'm on the phone to my husband. The signal is bad in some parts of the hotel, and he comes in and out. What? he says, when he thinks I'm talking too quietly. What did you say? We have been married 25 years, and for the last year have been planning to divorce. We have not seen one another for more than two months, but we speak often on the phone in a rambling, contented way that we never did when we were married. Sometimes, in the very early mornings, he rings me and says, Did you see that on the news? We do not talk about getting divorced or staying married, and it is possible we will stay in this in-between space for a long time, calm for the first time in ages. The anger between us somehow died. Often there are packages from him, books that he has read and thinks I will like. Sometimes he messages, What did you think? I am never tempted to write back. I think we are the happiest we have ever been. What has also died is the hotel, which my father owned, and before that his father, and which I have run, and now is closing. I have tried to find someone to buy it, but no one will. For a long time the hotel has had a reputation as being haunted, and people came here to see if they would be woken by ghosts in the night. Over the last few years the reputation soured, and the rumours about the hotel turned bad. Guests stopped coming. There was no money coming in, and I wanted to do something different with my life. I had never seen a ghost in the hotel. In one of our arguments, my husband said, I lacked imagination. When I told the receptionist I had never seen a ghost at the hotel, she said that not every haunted place was haunted for every person at every moment of their lives. She was into tarot cards and star signs. On the phone now, my husband says, What's it like? Is it strange? Yes, very strange. I'm the last person here. Weird. Tell me what it's like. Okay. I described to him the rooms emptied of the furniture we've been unable to sell, the bare reception desk, the gleaming kitchen filled with long shadows which I try to avoid moving in and out of. I describe the smell, which is of bleach and air freshener. I have all my keys on an enormous key ring, a big bunch, which I hold as I go along. Did I ever tell you my story about the hotel? My husband says on the phone. I am in the laundry room, checking the plugs. When I straighten, my knees make soft popping sounds. What story? I must have told you, he says. He sounds further away, as if he has travelled without my knowing and is in a different country. It is possible that I do not remember his face right, or that he has aged in two months and is now different from when I knew him. The phone line makes a click-click sound, and when it comes back on I realise he is laughing quietly. An unfamiliar laugh. What? I say. I was just thinking about the story. Do you have time? Shall I tell you now? Okay, I say. I sit on the edge of one of the washing machines. The keys in my pocket dig awkwardly into my thigh, and I have to move them to get comfortable. The hotel makes no sound around me, which is strange because it was always a place filled with noises, an echo chamber of guests and staff. My father used to hold up both hands and say, Do you hear that? A sound which he named contentment, a gentle mutter of onwardness. My husband is talking. I have become distracted and have lost the thread. I begin to listen to him. He is speaking about the times he used to come to the hotel to pick me up or drop off lunch. I can hear him choosing his words carefully, remembering. He would come into the hotel and, without asking anyone where I was, would look until he found me, and then we would go and sit outside or in the kitchen, and I would eat the food while he watched and listened to me telling him about my day. It had been a good moment in a marriage that had become riddled through with awkwardness and selfish acts. 
we had forgotten how to speak to one another, how to speak about one another to others. At dinner parties with friends, we would drift to different sides of the room, and I would notice an absence in the way we acted and spoke. We might have been strangers. He's still talking. I feel bad for becoming distracted. His voice is soft, and it goes over my face and hands like water. And I pinch my arm and try and concentrate, take in the words. I came one day, and I couldn't find you, he is saying. I'd made lunch, a jacket potato and tuna, because I knew that you would have forgotten to eat. I looked for you everywhere, in all the normal places. It had never happened before that I couldn't find you. You were often the centre of activity. All the ripples of other events led to you. I began to feel confused and even upset. I hadn't understood right. I couldn't find you. It was too late to ask anyone, and besides, the hotel had seemed so quiet that day, increasingly quiet as I went around. Occasionally I spotted someone, but when I went towards them, they would go off busily. I got angry with you. It was as if you were being purposely difficult to find. There was a red door behind the reception desk that I hadn't noticed before, and thought must lead into a staff room. I thought that I heard your voice as I came close to the door, and I opened it, and beyond there wasn't a room, but a corridor, low, dingy, a staff way hidden from the guests. I went along the corridor, holding the Tupperware. At the end I came into what appeared to be the reception area, as if I'd looped around. Where before it had been quiet, it was very busy now, bustling, people with bags, the phone ringing and ringing. No one seemed to notice me looking for you. In the kitchen, they were chopping enormous pieces of meat, hacking at them. The floor, slippery. The more I moved around, searching for you, the more I began to realize that this wasn't quite the same hotel it had been before. The corridor had taken me into a hotel which was almost exactly the same, but somehow not quite familiar. There were small differences. Furniture wasn't the same colour. Some of the windows were a lot higher than they normally were. Even the people's faces weren't quite right. I went into the bar, and you were there. Your back was to me, and you were sitting on one of the bar stools, and even from behind, it was awful, because you were the same, but there was something wrong with the way you held yourself, with the way you sat. I understood, looking at you. Listen, I was still holding that stupid Tupperware, that something had gone differently in your life. Nothing big but there had been an infinitesimal change, and though you were my wife, you were also someone completely different. You were talking to a man whose face I could see, flat planes, sharp angles, and you reached out and put your hand against his cheek, and seeing you do this, this awful, intimate thing, I knew that you didn't love me, not just the W, but the real you, who I had brought lunch to. You had never loved me. It had been a pretense that we carried on because we had no idea what else to do. My husband stops talking. I sit on the washing machine, holding the phone to my ear, pressing it there. I wait for him to say something else. But the story seems to be over. A dream? I say, my voice sounds a little hoarse, as if we'd been talking for days. I clear my throat and laugh for one note to show him that I know the story is just a story, that it is okay to carry on with a phone call, to maybe talk about animal memes we've both seen on the internet, or reality TV. A dream, I say again, more certain this time. A dream, he says. I don't know about that. I get down off the washing machine and go out into the reception area beyond. 
There is no door behind the desk, as I know, and I feel myself carefully not checking. I have been over the whole hotel now, and it is time to go. The late light of the day comes through the high windows and strikes the floor in beams. I go to the front door and depress the handle, but it is locked, which I must have done as I let the last staff member leave. I hold the phone between my shoulder and ear, and I go through my keychain, looking for the large, burnished key that I always carry. It is not there. I get down onto the floor and spread out the keys, touching each one, examining them. I can hear my husband's breath down the phone, the small wheeze he sometimes lets out when he is tired or stressed. After I saw you, at the bar. He says, I didn't want to go back through the door and into the other hotel, the hotel where the real you, or the other you, was waiting. I didn't know what I would say to you. I went around the hotel, looking at the things that were different, trying to work out what to do, moving in a daze, my body going without my brain really telling it to. In the reception area, I sat down. There was a man reading a newspaper in one of the other chairs, and at some point he lowered it, and I could see that it was me. We looked at one another. I could see in his face that he didn't yet know about you, about how little you loved me, about how everything would go. There was a cleanness to him, a freshness that I admired. He looked at me with this question on his face, and I understood that if I asked him to, he would go through the door and into the other hotel. He would come back here to you, and I could stay there. I wanted to stay there in that other place. I really wanted to stay there. I am looking and looking for the keys, but they're not there. I go through into the bar and try the door that leads out into the garden, but it is locked. And that key is missing too. I can feel the thrum of something which might be unstoppable. My husband is talking quietly now about other things, about a book he has been reading which he thinks I will like, about a dog he sees when he goes for a walk. I go out of the bar and back into the reception area. I do not want to, but my body takes me there. Through the phone, beneath the sound of my husband's voice, there is a ringing, a low, nearly silent tone, deep. In the reception, I look behind the desk, and there is, yes, a door, a red door. Juliet Stevenson was reading the story by Daisy Johnson. The producer was Justine Willett.